coffee certainly is a sacred, sacred, sacred drink. We hold the beans and sis. Sanctity. It's sacred because coffee is, as we all know, is a stimulant, but it gives you so much energy and vitality and vital force, and and we honor that, right? Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I have wanted to have Ola Tacombo on the show for a long time now, so it was a pleasure to finally make it happen. I've been listening to Ola's offerings for years now, and I'm always struck by her wisdom and her open-hearted spirit as well. We recorded this episode while Ola Tukumba was in Kenya visiting her family. She told me she was in a mud hut village without any Wi-Fi, but she did have some cellular service. It's pretty amazing what technology can do these days, but that being said, we did have some technical difficulties with this episode, and it was actually so bad we ended up recording on two separate days. We spent about 90 minutes on day one, which included a lot of, can you hear me now? And oops, now you're frozen again. (laughs) And finally, we just had to call it a day. And then we finished the interview the following day. The audio, and if you're watching on YouTube, the visual are not stellar for this episode, but as you'll see, the quality of the content makes it well worth the effort. So lots of gratitude for Ola and her patience, and lots of gratitude for Francesca, who did all of the video and auditing editing. She definitely had a lot of work cut out for her with this one. For those of you who don't already know my guest, she's the owner of Amarate Salud y Bienstar, an apothecary and wellness space located in Mayagüez, Puerto Rico. Ola Tacumbo Abasi has been working in the wellness field for over 15 years, a yoga and dance instructor, clinical herbalist, nutritionist, and birth doula committed to community, holistic health, social justice, and education. She works heavily in community service and Afro-Indigenous medicine on the island and beyond. As a member of the American Herbalist Guild, she was the 2019 award recipient for her notable work in supporting diversity and equity and justice in herbalism. Presently, she coordinates Herbalists Without Borders International on the island of Borican, providing community service to people in need. She also trains local and online students in clinical herbalism and healing arts through her school, Well of Indigenous Wisdom. A guest presenter and teacher of many conferences, she's originally from Africa. Her travels around the world are extensive as she integrates traditional knowledge of herbs with her Western education. She received her Master's of Science from Maryland University of Integrative Health. Ola Tacumbo is a mother of three young adults, and she continues to learn from her children through challenge and tribulation as she shares her journey of life with them and the human family. Welcome so much to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, Ola. I'm just so thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. It's nice to be here with you. I've been uh, admiring your work for a while, too. So Aww. happy to be with you today. <laughs> and I am kind of just like, you know, even though I know the modern world we live in, it is pretty amazing to me that I get to talk to you while you're in Kenya. Yes, it's not amazing. <laughs> yeah, what's it like in Kenya at this time of year? Oh, it's dry, um, hot. Uh, not that hot, not as hot as Puerto Rico. It depends on where you are, you know. I, My people are from the western province of Kenya, so 
that's where I am right now, visiting my ancestral home. And it's pretty cool at night, not too cool and nice and hot in the daytime. Uh, it hasn't rained that much, uh, so it's not rainy season yet, but rainy season will be coming up in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's beautiful weather. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you mentioned you spent the day in the forest, so you got to spend time with plants. Yes, I spent time with the plant people. Uh, I went to, so I'm from the Western province of, my mother is from the Western province of Kenya. It is also where I spent a lot of my childhood. This is where I became a herbalist. Mm. So I went with my cousins today to a pretty popular forest for us here. It's a national forest called Kakamega National Forest. And uh, we just walked around, you know, visited some trees and plants and uh, there is just a beautiful view to see the entire forest that covers all our our ethnic our ethnic group. Yeah, and I met lots and lots of plants. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to meet too many animals except for a terrapin, a uh, colobus monkey, a couple of colobus mm -hmm. monkeys. But I didn't get to meet any leopards or pythons or any anybody else who's out there. <laughs> wild pigs i also met plant people of course um i mm -hmm. should mention that i met ficus which is also an, a kind of cotton very popularly found in puerto rico most tropical areas the ficus tree like a fig tree and the fig family and i met 800 year old teak tree um i met uh i met nettle and go to Cola, Centella, Asiatica, and uh, and then I met coffee, wild coffee. <laughs> well, I'm looking out my office window, and we got a foot of snow overnight, so it's it's a little different here, so it's nice to hear about what's going on in <laughs> yes. the, the world. <laughs> so you mentioned you're at where you became an herbalist, and I'd love to hear more about your, you know, plant journey and where that's taken you. Well, I learned herbalism here. Right here where I am right now, I was about seven years old when it all unlocked for me. Whenever I come home, the elders tell me about myself, my little self, who loved to run around in nature, climb trees, uh, just couldn't stay still. I look around and there's so many eucalyptus trees, you know, different kinds. And eucalyptus was my first plant that I learned mm -hmm. uh, with. Um, so it's nice to be back and to to feel your, you know, after so many years, you know, that you're still alive, number one, and number two, that, you know, these are the plants that you've, you know, you grew up with. And this place is what uh, formed, uh, formed me as a, as a herbalist and many other things that I am uh, through plant medicine. So that's what it feels like to be here. <laughs> mm. And that's how herbalism has been, formed you know formed me from this place and i'm very grateful but it's also uh grown um in so many ways uh around the world and had many teachers many lessons that have created who i am today including uh being in puerto rico Boriquen, um and my teachers there and the and the land there that has supported my my path and would you like to speak to any of those different paths that um, that you found yourself on through the years? Sure. Well, you know, Africa is my foundation. My father is Nigerian. And so, you know, Kenya and Nigeria, two popular countries. I feel that both Kenya supported me as a youth. You know, I grew up here. Nigeria supported me as a young woman entering her spiritual initiation and rites of passage. Um, so I learned plant medicine there in that manner, you know, working with my spirituality and spirituality for others. Puerto Rico, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to miss out my Western education with Thai Sophia Institute, which became Maryland University of Integrative Health. Um, and that's an important piece as well, because that gave me vocabulary and you know, sort of direction and compass to to work with the medicine. 
Um, so I'm very grateful for that education. And um, and then working in Puerto Rico with my godmother um, in the Taino tradition uh, has been an amazing work mm -hmm. of uh, self-realization and also community work. It's uh, My work in Puerto Rico has taught me a lot about community service and community work. Um, clients have taught me uh, a, a lot too, of course, with their feedback, you know, clinical work, clinical herbalism is, is so satisfying, but also can be very frustrating <laughs> if you don't get the results you want or people don't get the results that they want. But I often have no frustrations with clinical herbalism. The only one would be just people having, you know, good compliance, people taking what they need to take, knowing that herbal medicine is uh, another way of healthcare. Um, you know, whether working side by side with conventional or an option. Um, so it, that's all formed, formed ideas. It's created me, to, you know, my school, um, me becoming a teacher. Um, yeah, and just growing spiritually as well. I'm so excited that you chose coffee to talk about today, especially because you're basically in the birthplace of coffee right now. You even visited Wild Coffee today. So I also love it too because sometimes people don't think of coffee as an herb. You know, that's just for whatever reason that's just not people don't make that connection. Um, mm -hmm. And I personally love coffee for people who say herbs don't work, and then uh, then you know they're mm -hmm. often coffee drinkers. So it's like, well, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, hello. I, I'd love to hear more from you about coffee. Well, here we call coffee kahawa. And coffee moved from East Africa. We're talking about Abyssinia, Ethiopia, which included Kenya. And then we have Somalia. Um, but mostly you would find it in Kenya and, um, and Ethiopia. So coffee moved around with Arab, the Arab trade, which included slave trade. That's how it ended up into the Western world. Arabs were very big traders between Africa and Europe, and of course, eventually the Americas. The Americas has, have come to be the big coffee makers and drinkers because of this, right? But it's all, it all comes from originally from here, from East Africa, particularly here, Kenya or Abyssinia, Ethiopia, Kenya. And we traditionally honor coffee, you know, like anything that becomes really popular, Let's talk about sage. Let's talk about even ayahuasca at this moment, right? Let's talk, even tea, tea leaves, which is also here, you know, very prominent cash crop, crop, traditional crop for, for here for Kenya. Um, they all once were very sacred, held sacred. Coffee certainly is a sacred, sacred, sacred drink. We hold the beans and sanctity. You know, it's a sacred plant. It's sacred because Coffee is, you know, as we all know, is a stimulant, but it gives you so much energy and vitality and vital force, and and we honor that, right? But of course, all plants are sacred. So, coffee in itself is a strong plant. It's um, we've used it to help us with headaches. We've used it traditionally to help us with any, you know, stomach aches. You know, as you know, it's a laxative. We wear it, we use it as a detoxifier, wash in it, bathe in it, make enemas with it. It's, you know, make a, a coffee tea, or if you want, wish to say a coffee infusion uh, to rinse the body and to rid it and strip it of any detox uh, skin issues, but also uh, energy spiritually, right? So <clears throat> this is the coffee bean mainly that's used, not the leaf. When we drink it, we don't drink a lot. We drink very little. We don't use milk. There's no cappuccino, cappuccino, <laughs> and all that. It's just a cup of dark coffee that has been carefully roasted, collected, roasted, uh, you know, dried first before it's roasted, of course, and then um, in a, spe a specific way, then ground and um, and then uh, decocted. And then we have coffee ceremonies where we all <clears throat> drink together and join in conversations. Some 
something like you would see with the kawa kawa uh, ceremonies in the Polynesian areas, the Papua New Guinea culture, where people work hard and then they come together and they sit and they have coffee to uh, collect, connect, and to reason, to recap their day, you know, to give them inspiration. It's it's a drink of enlightenment. We always traditionally have our coffee with peanuts and we also have our tea with peanuts my uncle i went to visit the other day served tea and peanuts you know it's tradition sesame seeds and peanuts so our coffee is salt (laughs) (laughs) well thank you for sharing all of that and i one thing that sticks out for me is that you're talking about all these different ways of working with the coffee plant not just as a drink but also working with it externally which makes me think of your recipe, the coffee scrub. And I'm wondering if you would just kind of walk us through that recipe and share a bit about that with us. Yeah. So it's a pretty common recipe. I think a lot of people do it now. Here, you know, we wear coffee a lot and we mix it with, actually a a part that I didn't put in the recipe is cloves as an option. So clove oil. I just didn't think about it because it's not a common thing to get a hold of in the Western world, um, but it's pretty common here. So I did add almonds, but so the recipe is, uh, includes freshly ground coffee. So the coffee beans freshly ground. Um, And of course another very special plant that connects connects me to the Americas is uh, cacao. Uh, so the cacao beans also uh, were freshly ground and then just mix it up together and blend uh, coconut oil, which is very common here and has become a common oil uh, tro- uh, for around the world because so it grows in the tropics. Yeah, it grows in <clears throat> coconuts grow in Puerto Rico as well. Um, and then vanilla, which is really common here and almonds as well, which are both, one, almonds are very common in Puerto Rico. So, um, I like this scrub to wake me up in the morning. I like it to invigorate, because as I said, coffee is an inspirational plant. Uh, It has that essence of inspiration and focus. So, I've also made flower essences with coffee flowers. That's really powerful. They help you focus. They help you, you know, uh, move through difficult tasks and thoughts. So I very much appreciate that with coffee. And I feel that when I do the coffee scrub in the morning, it's like if I have a lot of clients and then it'll be a challenging day, I'll you know, just prepare myself with with that coffee essence. Um, You know, it takes away bad odor as well, you know, not that that's not anything I'm really experiencing, but I've just thought about that as far as people who might be having, you know, more um, energetically, more, you know, what in Ayurveda is called pitta-like constitutions. Coffee is really, really good for people like that. So... Yep, that's the basis, basics of the, sh- of the scrub is to exfoliate the skin, anything that's dark or hyperpigmentation, um, just, you know, eczema, psoriasis, the type of situation, um, uh, fungi, uh, all, all sorts of skin care and just detox. I use coffee for that. Inside and out, I guess. And of course, there's abuse of coffee, you know, too much coffee, just like too much chocolate is not so good, you know, all the caffeine and can be a little too stimulating for, for hormonal women, these bleeding uh, during menses. I would just be, I'll avoid it and take caution of that if that's something people haven't done or do. And use coffee internally. <laughs> Sorry for those pieces. <laughs> I'd love if you could share some tips about sourcing coffee because there's a lot of problematic coffee sources. So yeah, what would you like to share about that? 
Well, that's good. A good question. Thinking about the coffee that I use, I get local coffee in Puerto Rico, and or here. My actually, my great aunt, my mom, my grandmother's sister owned a coffee farm, tea farm. Oh, huh. She's pretty sick right now, so she hasn't been managing that. Um, so I am basically, you know, very big on local local access. So I ask people to, you know, to look into that. I mean, that's my practice. So, you know, when I make coffee scrubs to sell personal, or for my personal use, I just always source local. And, you know, in Puerto Rico, I go as local as the region that I stay in. So there's several regions, for instance, um, I say in a region called Ormigueros, there's other regions like Lares, um, you know, other places. And there are lots of coffee farms in those areas. But I tend to only actually purchase coffee from Ormigueros, which is where I stay in Maya, a, a, a little city outside of Maya West. I would try not to do anything large industry, you know, definitely not Nescafe or anything big like that right just choose as local as you can and if you can make it yourself which is a lot of work um do it try it especially as a herbalist it's good to try these things from scratch mm. curing the coffee beans etc and since you see a lot of coffee farms do you see difference in like the health of the land between say organically grown or shade grown it's often commonly put on labels too yeah absolutely i mean the land is you know anyone who produces mindfully and their interest is obviously to produce to to for economical benefits which is fine but when you have equal interest in the health of the land and health of the plant and health of people as in economical benefits of, of the plant, you know, that the plant can bring to you, then I think that makes a very good marriage yeah, of good medicine. And so, for instance, my, one of my neighbors who was a, he was a nationalista, which is a type of, you say, a revolutionary in Puerto Rico, who I actually like revolutionaries. My grandfather was a revolutionary here in Kenya, actually, in the Mau Mau. So I have volunteered on his land and, you know, visited his house, which is where he was assassinated, actually. Um, anyway, there's coffee there. So it's got an energy, yeah. It's got an energy of revolution. It's got an energy of, you know, somebody who stood up for the land and for the people, wanted independence, for Puerto Rico until death, right there where he wanted independence. So for me, it says a lot about the plant medicine that comes from that land, that type of tending and the spirit that is on the land still. Um, so I think people should choose sources that connect with their own story or their belief um, because that makes the medicine uh, different. If you wear it differently. You you're really wearing the whole story of the land and those who are associated with it. Walking in the forest here today, seeing all the wild coffee was like, tears came to my eyes because um, number one, this is not just, I'm not just in Kenya, I'm in where my tribe is from and that we cannot trace, trace but maybe thousands of years migrated in this space. So. How many of my ancestors have walked in that forest? You know, how many have um, associated themselves with those plants? That just gives such a, a fuzzy feeling, connection that's so, 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 so profound, so, so, so deep. And so to see that coffee there and, you know, knowing that its uh, origins are from here uh, just brings such a smile on my face. So... So that coffee, that coffee medicine <laughs> is is different. You know, speaking of plant medicine and land, right, and how how we give back, a coffee medicine is uh, is is different. It has a ancestral 
reason. So when I wear it, you know, and feel it, drink it, I'm really like connecting with the old ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so glad that you brought that up because some of my favorite teachings from you is about that connection to the land and the connection to the plants around you. And just mm -hmm. what a powerful approach to herbalism that can be there's kind of they're studying plants on paper but then there's being yes. with the plants and working with the plants of your land so and that's like for me that's where the juiciness is of herbalism and really the I don't know it's essence in a way that really brings it all to life yes 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 I mean you just can't take the land away from herbalism while I love bottles and jars and you know, I'm certainly a collector of all of those, you know, just I don't know any herbalist who doesn't have heaps of jars and containers, you know, I might use for another day. Somebody might need this. Um, that that material, of course, is just a container for for what we want to put together. And then, of course, what we want to put together comes from somewhere. Right. So the land is uh, the we just don't have it without the land that end product container is nothing compared to where it begins which is is on that earth the bones and the mm. minerals of of the earth yeah. yeah yeah thank you for saying that so herbalism is just beautiful with with this knowledge of land connection mm. yeah thank you is there anything else you'd like to share about coffee? Hmm. Other than that, like most sacred plants, it would be nice to see, you know, more honor of the plant. And even this knowledge I feel like I'm sharing is not known. And unfortunately, it's an example of many herbs and plant medicines that we should use them. And I know things go around and are carried in water and carried by people and that's fine but it's good to it's good to be aware of that you know like anyone who's in the western world or in europe or asia drinking coffee you know as they put that drink to their lips you know it should be oh, thank you africa you know for this drink right I, it's almost like these transfers mm -hmm. of blessing it's the same thing i do with cacao you know it's like oh thank you americans you know, take, thank you, Native people of Americans, for this, for these beans. So, how how do we bless each other in in with these plants? That's what that's what that's about, yeah. So, I just ask people to get out of the kind of Starbucks mode of coffee and think about it when you put it to your lips. You know, how blessings, send some blessings to to this land here for for bringing this up in this part of the world. Hmm. I love that. Well, every time I drink coffee, I'm going to do that now. It's good. good, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like blowing a kiss across the world. <laughs> what I love about it is that when we have blessings for the things that we're, you know, drinking or eating, it's just this whole reciprocal action, right? That by, it's like by me having gratitude, I also get blessings from that because it's just this like continual loop of Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You get it. You get it. It's, it's, there's no loss. Nobody loses. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Well, I'm really excited to hear what's going on in your herbal world right now because you have a lot going on and a really awesome school. So I just, I want to hear all about it. Everything you have to share. Yeah. Well, Oh, in my herbal world, oh my goodness, okay. Um, so what's coming up is I have the Caribbean Herbal Symposium. This is the first one, and we're holding it in February, February 9th to February 12th. We have a rent, we're renting out a space called the Hacienda Juanita, and people can stay over, and there are meals that will be served, and awesome teachers from all over the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Borican. So I had a vision um, 2020 uh, to put, uh, simplify the people together in, in Puerto Rico, in Borican. That's where it started. And then I thought, oh, 
you know, we need to unite what he can with other Caribbean people because it felt it was like very isolated from the Caribbean. Um, I think because it's a it's a U.S. territory uh, colony, so um, it's you know, ten people tend to just focus on the U.S. and there's just that interrelationship, and of course because of political reasons, it's harder to connect with other Caribbean countries who are very close neighbors. So I figured, you know, let's do this. Let's put this, let's put healers together. They're awesome healers, awesome people who live in the mountains all over who know so much plant medicine. Don't get, don't, they're not on Instagram, Facebook, social media, written books, but they're there and there are teachers you know, those of us who are on social media, written books and, you know, teaching. So they need to be heard and they need their work to be shown and represented. And another thing is we need to all unite. Sometimes in the healing community, we're just so separated, you know. So I wanted us to come together and to share with each other. Because I'm very committed to the Taino tradition there, I, and as an African, so the Afro-Indigenous aspect of myself, Indigenous to hear, and then the indigenous adoption to there, I felt that I wanted to represent this people who are hardly represented in herbalism. There comes a Caribbean Herbal Symposium. So people can come to learn about Afro-Indigenous people and medicines and healing and herbalism. Also know that we have a narrative that has been there forever and we are willing to share, you know, to share it. So that's one of my projects. This symposium, I can just tell, it just feels so important and is quite the vision. And like you said, pulling in people who um, you know, live in the mountains or aren't on social media and learning from these people is just so important. And um, I'm wondering how people can be involved with the symposium. Yes. Well, um, in several ways, we are accepting sponsorship. We need sponsorship to, you know, if anyone has run a symposium or a gathering, it takes, it's a lot more than you think it is. And I'm definitely learning that as we've been planning it, myself and the team. That information will can be available at the Caribbean Herbal Symposium.com. We also have the Caribbean Herb Symposium Instagram uh, link. And people can come and attend when registration opens. You know, people are welcome to come to the classes and learn with respect. We have community agreements, you know, that ask for us to be respectful and open-minded and, you know, not appropriate, uh, all these agreements. And, you know, to share the word, like what you're doing, Rosalie, you know, this is, this is a, creating a forum, a space for for people to know about the Caribbean Herbal Symposium. This is just the first year. We expect that it will grow uh, throughout the years and the years to come. We ask that that people share. Come if you can. It's February 9th to 12th. All right, so here we are, day two of recording this podcast. Thanks again so much for your patience, Ola. I'm just so, so grateful that you're here and really enjoying the conversation despite the technical difficulties. And where we left off is you were sharing about the Caribbean Symposium, which I am so excited about. The second that I heard about this from you, I knew, I just saw it was going to be a very impactful event, a very important event. And I don't know if you know this, but I lived in the Dominican Republic. So the Caribbean has oh. a special place in my heart. Yeah. And so I didn't know. Yeah. So I'm just I'm really excited about it. And so I wanted to just recap that people can be involved by if they own an herbal business, they could be a sponsor. But yes. You're also accepting small donations from everybody because it takes yes. so much to get a conference going. Yeah. Like you it does. said, people don't really know that no, like everything that goes into it because they just show up you know for the event yes. but it takes months yes. of planning and uh, you have to rent I mean you have to put out a lot of money to rent the space and get the teachers taken care of and on and on and on so yeah um, so people you're looking for business sponsors but even small donations and I know small donations can add up um, they're really yes. important so I will put links on how to donate uh, in the show notes. 
so people can easily Thank find you. that and be a part of this really important event. And yeah, thank you for having this vision, for sticking with it for a couple of years even. And yeah, and I'm excited to see how it comes into fruition. Yeah, thank you so much. No, oh, thank you. So that's the Herbal Symposium. And I also really want to hear about your school because you have yes. a lot of wonderful things going on there. And even just this conversation, I'm just like a little bit jealous of your students to be able to spend so much time with you and, yes. just, you know, be a part of your wisdom circle and all that you have to share. So I'd love to hear more about your school. Yes. Well, I, I have, I run the Well of Indigenous Wisdom School. Um, been since 2012 and started in Pittsburgh and then moved on to Mayagüez, Puerto Rico. I have, you know, a small groups. I used to, I'm just changing for 2023. I'm going to have one class a year, but I had been having a group of six or seven, five, six, seven students three times a year. And it just has become overwhelming. So now I'm, I'm doing it differently. Well of Indigenous Wisdom School focuses on Indigenous wisdom. So it's the best I can do because that's what my lifestyle is anyway. Uh, So-called modern Indigenous person or woman. Where I am right now in this very, very rural area, you know, people still are living in mud huts here. You know, as I mentioned, this is the first place I learned about healing arts and medicine. This is my tribe here. I'm with my tribe right now here. And so that background is just the foundation of, is, is not just, is the foundation of my whole essence. The wisdom that I learned, not just from words, but from action, from learning to be an observer, from learning how to speak manifestation, how to be simple yet powerful in all our actions, and how to really be intentional when we're making medicine, because I learned from my first teacher here that we make medicine not just from the plants, but we make medicine to add our own essence. We, the medicine person who's making the medicine. So that's indigenous wisdom. You know, we are not working with like machines and factories and processing industry, which are good and fine. However, that's a, you know, that's a, a different, an industrialized right kind of uh, lifestyle indigenous wisdoms really speaks about the wisdom of the ancestors the wisdom of the earth wisdom of nature and putting that and injecting it into each lifestyle and each intentional thing that you do which everything we sh we do should be intentional and with purpose the wisdom school is 14 month program of well i'm adding a third part so it's got three levels so it's the first level is about Indigenous wisdom, about learning how to heal. Uh, I believe that students and people who work with people in healing, because this is a clinical clinical herbalism track, should really know what they need to heal in themselves. People should learn how to understand their own needs and their own healing before they work with other people. Just there's been so many healers who hurt their clients. So the first level is that, you know, learning how to heal oneself, tools that are needed to work with healing, discovering the magic and spirituality of plant medicine. Then the second level is more clinical materia medica physiology, but I take it a little in an interesting way because I like really, I love a lot to discuss the physiology in, in a way of the cosmos, which is indigenous wisdom, you know, in a metaphysical way. So, you know, we as the body are part of the cosmos and the stars and interconnected with the astrolected with the insect world, the ants and the termites and the worms and all the microbes that also exist. And so I use this wisdom to and integrate it into the physiology, how we have become who we are. And also how we stay healthy and how we stay connected. We stay connected as we, Im as we are an image of that which is outside of us in the whole universe. So we are cosmic beings, right? Because we live in a cosmic world. Yeah. So then Materia Medica comes in with that. And then the third level is a mentorship program. It was not mandatory, now it is. So I found that it's helping students to be more successful, to give them more guidance and to have them experience clinic with me 
um, before I would, you know, just finish theory, theory and then say, okay, go out there and do clinical work and, you know, just have a couple of days of clinical observation, but, and supervision, but now I'm opening that up. And with the mentorship, it will be about a three week program. It has always been, but now it's mandatory. So it will be three weeks together with me and I'll have free clinics. So I'll set up clients in the community. At the moment I've been doing it only in Puerto Rico, but now I'm going to open it up to here, to Africa, to here, my village and have locals be our come for free clinics. And so we can serve them with herbal medicine here. Mm, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I love in the sharing about your school, I feel like we just get a deeper look into what all it is that you have to offer. So thank you for that. Yes. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. I, I like, I really, really love staying connected with my students. I just see them as colleagues and, you know, I like to see what they do. I, I, I really love to see people successful, you know, and, and I, that's what I, you know, the school wants is people to be, be successful, be useful, be, you know, fulfill their purpose out there in the planet. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. You know, indigenous wisdom is, is endless and timeless and it can be applied anywhere and anyhow. It's not a, a linear, you know, expir ex has an expiration date. It's always able to be built. I, I tell my students that, you know, you hear what I'm saying, but build on it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and make it twist it into your own lifestyle and your own experiences because that is wisdom. Wisdom is the experience we have that we can never really buy or learn and read in a book. We just have to live life. That's how we get wise. The school promotes that, you know, promotes an everlasting oh. connection with each other and also with myself as a teacher and founder mm. of the school. Yeah, mm, that's beautiful. Is there anything else you'd like to share about the projects that you have going on in your life? No, I mean, you know, I, I already discussed about the Caribbean Herbal Symposium, you know, uh, something that I'm really excited about. I just can't wait to see how this comes together this January, this connect, collection of people we've selected to teach. Just It's just amazing to, to have the first Caribbean symposium ever, herbal symposium. It's, it's amazing. And I, I hope that there'll be a lot of people who will attend, you know, and putting it out there that I would like to have a whole bunch of people attend and register when we open registration, please come out and, sh and support, you know, you know, this is supporting the teachers, this is supporting people who are out there that haven't been known, who are powerful, who are beautiful, who are knowledgeable, who are wise, who are spiritual, doing really good work in the community, grassroots people. Uh, leaders. We have a cacique from Jamaica who will be coming. He's awesome leader. He's a medicine man. He's going to be sharing ritual with us and showing us a Taino, a Taino ritual. So please do come oh. out and support. Send this information around to other people who you know would would like to support uh, the Caribbean Herbal Symposium. Support doesn't come in only one way. There could be the monetary support, there's the sharing support, word of mouth, you know, or just saying, hey, I like what you're doing and just send a love heart like on Instagram and keep following. There's all, all ways of just sending, you know, a prayer and intention out there to support our cause and to build us up. I also work with Herbalists Without Borders. To be honest, I haven't been very strong in that direction. This last hurricane took a lot out of me. It's partly why I'm also here with my family. Excuse my uncle is in the background because I needed to really rest. I was very, very tired. And, and you know, if you work in the healing and herbal circle, you know that rest is so important and support from your beloved. So my family said, come home and let's take care of you. Mm. Um, but Herbalists Without Borders, please continue to support them. And locally, I work with Boricua, Boricua Barefoot Doctors. And uh, it's a small grassroots group that we also help during. And I did work with them after the hurricane. So we, we work on, on the floor. So if you want to follow Boricua Barefoot Doctors on Facebook uh, and support them, here, please do so. At least just follow so you can see how you can support moving forward. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I also had wanted to say to for people to attend the symposium, to share about the symposium. So I'm so glad you said that so beautifully and eloquently. 
And yeah. to finish, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, to finish, I ask everyone the same question. And admittedly, it feels a little silly to ask you a question because I feel like you've just been oozing this the entire time we've been chatting together. But to follow the formula, I'm going to ask it to you anyway. And the season six last question yeah. is this. The plants give us so much. How do you like to get back to the plants and reciprocity? Mm. <sighs> Indeed, the plants give us so much, yeah? I mean, the forest walk yesterday that we were talking about with the coffee and nettles and and all the other beautiful plants that they give us, those lots of cedar and, you know, thuja, right? And just a family, a grand family of thuja, of cedar, I recognize and reciprocate plants because I recognize that they are so giving. Their empathy and their love is so available and open anytime, anyhow, anyway, right? And so it's my my purpose to give back to the plant world by always educating. I was with the young people yesterday, my young cousins, and I was in the world, young men. And I was saying to them, you know, We shouldn't be littering. When we cut down trees, we should replant them. Uh, We need to be aware of, you know, how our ecosystem functions. Let's keep recycling. Let's not overburden the earth, right? Let's allow certain plants to grow. Let's allow mushrooms to grow, fungi to survive. Let's not think that certain things are dirty or let's also learn to coexist with the animals. We know that butterflies and bees and worms and earthworms and all these little creatures that are so, so important in running and managing our life on this planet need to survive. And so in my educational practices, even on my Instagram, I'm always posting about animals if that occurs or um, speaking to the community, to children, to young people, to my students, anywhere that I can about conserving and paying attention to to how the ecosystem runs so that everything can, you know, plants can survive as well as us and as well as the animals that are around us. The park I went to yesterday was wonderful because there are leopards there. There are leopards, there's wild pig, there's uh, the call of us monkey, which is the white and black monkey. There were terrapins, uh, what else? Uh, many other creatures there. And I asked a guide who was guiding us, you know, through the hike, how does he feel about these animals? Because most people are afraid of these animals. Oh, there's pythons. Yes, that's that one too. So he says, I don't kill them. You know, if they're bothering, right? That's when you do kill them. But most people are afraid of animals, afraid of certain plants. So they want to kill them or get rid of them. They think that they're a nuisance like weeds, which we all all know that many weeds are medicine. And so we have to become more knowledgeable. Let's get more educated and understand that animals and plants and the whole ecosystem works together. And if we kill them, then we are also cutting off a food chain. We're cutting off an aspect of our own lives. Lastly, I reciprocate because and how I reciprocate is in in just my entire lifestyle knowing that I am an, a reflection of what is outside of me so to keep what else what is outside of me beautiful and healthy means that I'm also caring for myself right and my children and my grandchildren and seven generations so this is how how I reciprocate and I'm I, mm. sorry, I hope I, that wasn't so large of an explanation. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you again for being here and for sharing your wisdom about coffee and for all the gifts that you spread throughout the world, through your school, through this new symposium and in sharings like this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalie, for this. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Ola Tacumbo's recipe for a coffee scrub. This would make a wonderful gift for the holidays. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. And there's also links for those of you who would like to support the Caribbean Herbal Symposium, whether it's through donating, sharing about the event, or attending. You can also find Olita Kumbo on Instagram and through her website, wellofindigenouswisdom.com. 
If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and your herbal thoughts about coffee. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad to have you here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.